<laughs> Just a minute, we're coming. Hi. And we're close, we're close, we're almost there, we're almost there. I'm waiting for Jeffrey to get me the signal. Well, welcome, CLC. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Halloween. I would love to wish everyone a blessed Samhain and an early Feliz Dia de los Muertes. I hope you guys are having a wonderful Sunday. I am so glad you're here today and that we can help you welcome in the week with joy, inspiration, and love. Before and now we come to our inner healing time. I invite everyone just to calm your body, center your mind. And go ahead and take a few deep breaths. Breathe in oxygen, life. And as you breathe out, release all that no longer serves you. Allow your body to relax in this moment. And allow your mind to put everything aside and be here now. Universal love enfolds me. Universal wisdom inspires me. Universal spirit enlightens me. Universal power encircles me. I am one and all is well. As we begin the inner healing process, let me invite you to relax in quiet confidence, opening yourself to the miracle working higher power. Now symbolize the unity of your thinking and feeling nature by touching your chest with your right hand and let my words act as your own. For your own inner healing, acceptance, and receptivity. I acknowledge that there is a power, intelligence, and wisdom greater than my own. I am in the midst of it, and it is in the midst of me, sensitive and responsive to my every thought, word, action, and feeling. I now make this true for myself by saying aloud, I acknowledge. Acknowledging this higher power working through my life, I admit that I am personally responsible for solving my own problems while being guided and assisted by something greater than myself. As I am ready to surrender the conflicts of my ego to the wisdom of the infinite presence, I simply speak these words, I surrender. Knowing that forgiveness is the key to unconditional love and the feeling of heaven, I now unconditionally forgive anyone and everyone who has ever injured me in any way, real or imagined. And I now forgive myself for all of my mistaken judgments and their resulting actions. From my deepest level of understanding, I now say, 
I forgive. Realizing that I continually experience the effects of my own thinking, I now choose to allow this higher power to recreate me deeply, filling my mind with thoughts that are only positive, constructive, loving, and beautiful. I call upon this divine inflow by stating aloud, I choose. I now center upon that one special idea that I'm willing to accept as real for me in this coming week. In visualizing that idea as already acted upon and brought to pass, in seeing my idea become a fact of my experience, I allow myself, I allow myself to really, sorry everybody. In seeing my idea become a fact of my experience, I enjoy the happiness and peace of my thought fulfilled and gratefully speak these words. I accept. I accept. Knowing that I have an everlasting place in the midst of the power that sustains all creation, as well as the support of all those around me, I allow myself to relax in the peace of fulfillment and gratitude and say, I release. I release. Now, in my mind's eye, I envision the presence of someone near and dear to me. This can be a friend, a family member, a teacher or mentor, Someone who has touched my life in deep and loving ways. Someone who may not be physically present in the room with me this morning. I turn toward that image in my mind's eye and say, I'm grateful for the good in your life. I'm for the good in your life. Now I open my eyes, turn to the world around me, and joyfully speak to anyone physically present in the room or virtually on this broadcast, and sharing confidence and gratitude and saying, I'm grateful for the good in your life. My topic this morning is there is magic all around us. <laughs> Awaken, rejoice, and sing. Have I heard that before? Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Bill Hornaday, do you know who he was? He was a legend in our movement. He was minister of Founders Church of Religious Science in Los Angeles for years and years and years, and a colleague of Ernest Holmes. And at the start of every one of his Sunday talks, because he believed in the power of suggestion, he would say, we have a wonderful topic this morning. He said that every week, unless it was an exciting topic. It was a wonderful topic or an exciting topic. And then he'd say pretty much the same thing week after week, teaching the science of mind, you know, with a different emphasis or so on. So I want to tell you today we have a wonderful and exciting topic, <laughs> which has to do with the fifth stage of growth as discussed in Emma Hopkins' High Mysticism and which began with Daniel's excellent presentation on the first of the month about the seed, planting the seed. And then we, we reigned all over it. I came back and we reigned all over it. And, and then we offered sunshine, plenty of sunshine to the seed. That was in the third week. In the fourth week we had the seed had germinated, grown up into a plant. Today we come to the time of harvest. And as Daniel pointed out, today is Halloween. It's actually Halloween. It's Sawen. Tomorrow is Dia de los Muertos, which is the combination of ideas that came from the Aztecs and also the Spanish Celts who colonized Mexico and brought a Celtic idea which gave rise to the Irish and in Brittany, the 
celebration of Samhain, which turned into Halloween. In other words, all of these things emanated from the same general concept of let's look at change, let's look at death. They're northern hemispheric, so they relate to the agricultural cycle as we have it in this hemisphere. And one of the students who was in a, a class with me over those two weekends um, last month wrote in her paper, she said, when the leaf falls, it returns its energy to the tree. And I just lost my mind over that. And I said, can I use that? And she said, yeah, absolutely. So when the, and I, now, see, I want to tell you who it was, but there were two students who said amazing, they all said amazing things, but two of them said amazing things enough that I wanted to cop their work and I asked them permission, but I don't want to give the wrong name. So I'll come back next week and tell you who it was said what I just said, okay? <laughs> because the other one said something equally amazing, but it didn't really go to the point of today. The point is that when the leaf falls, it returns its energy to the tree. That's not usually how we look at things. We look at things when the leaf falls, the leaf is dead. The leaf is over. The leaf is kaput, right? And you have a whole yard full of them. And we're surrounded by death. We're surrounded by endings. We're surrounded by the morbid and melancholy experience of things falling off and so we have to jolly ourselves up with some sort of holiday event. You can tell it's a special day at Creative Life if you're watching us for the first time. These singers do not usually dress like this. <laughs> this is something a little close, <laughs> close but not quite. Close but not quite. What happened when Halloween came to America largely with the Irish, is that we took it and we made it a cartoon of itself. Because it brought with it various spiritual dimensions and spiritual lessons we were not ready to explore. Having to do with mortality and having to do with ancestry. And so we turned it into <laughs> and stuff jumping out at you. And I told you last year, no, the year before, the last time we had people in the room around Halloween time, I told you that there's a haunted house, and I think it's Kentucky. I mean, a, you know, a manufactured haunted house that you go through, pay money to go through. They'll pay you $20,000 to finish it. <laughs> At least they were in 2019 when I brought it up. And you have to sign page after page of release forms, medical release forms. You have to be interviewed to go through this haunted house. You can only imagine what happens in there. And as of 2019, if I'm not mistaken, and you will know in a heartbeat if I am, thanks to the internet, but if I'm not mistaken, nobody's ever collected that money. So they run screaming over the hill out of whatever it is that goes on in that house. We do this to ourselves because we, we get numb, we get bored, you know? And so we need something to stir the pot a little bit, to get us excited. And spiritual values tell us, look within the self for all the excitement you could possibly want. Look within your own goal setting, your own ambition, your own vision, your own destiny, look within that. And it's the last place typically we as humans have wanted to look. Because it's scarier than any scary haunted house that they'd pay us money to make our way through. Because everything, all the chips are pushed out, everything is on the line when it has to do with us, when it has to do with our own experience. You wanna talk about mortality? We typically talk about somebody else's. We typically talk about it in the abstract. And this is one of the great uh, conundrums, I don't know, of human life, is the fact that every one of us ends in this form, every last one of us. And the only reason that's not in, incredibly uh, attention-getting is that it happens over a long period of time. And it happens seemingly randomly. That one day, you turn around and the chair next to you is empty. And if they were all empty, if everybody was taken all at once, well then, I mean, it would, it would have our attention so fully we'd 
we'd be almost paralyzed with fear, but it happens in a random sort of way. So we don't want to look at this as much by nature. Birth, oh yeah, you bet. Maturity, stages of growth that we can witness, we're all over that. But mortality is the thing we, we back away from. So instead we jump into stories about what the afterlife must look like and how there's really no mortality at all. You go into the next life and you're greeted by friends and relatives and you have a nice place to live and whatever struggles you've had on this earth are replaced by comforts. So if you've been poor, you now have money or whatever money can buy, you know, and if you've been sick, certainly, you now have a well form and you're no longer struggling in this way. I happen to believe that, but I also think it jumps a few steps, which is before every springtime, there's an autumn and winter, okay? We shed some things, we let some things go. And you see this just in ordinary spiritual practice in the science of mind, where somebody says, well, I'd like to create such and such in my life. You say, well, are you willing to give up whatever's in its place right now? Oh, no, not until, not until my new go good shows up. You know, I'm not willing to step out in that way to where there's like empty, you know, just I'm on this tightrope and there's no net. So I'm going to hold fast to what I have until you convince me that there's something better. That's not faith. That's transactional. Faith is saying I trust. I've cultivated a trust in this power. I've cultivated a trust in the universe that it's going to provide me with this or something greater. And if I'm willing to have something more in my life than what I now experience, I'm willing to let go and see what happens. And see, sometimes it'll, it'll sort of hover out there alongside me, you know, and sometimes it'll sort of drift off. But I'm willing to let go and I'm willing to trust because we don't know what's coming next. We don't know what tomorrow brings. We're trusting all the time anyway. We just don't call it that, you know. So we try to control as much as we possibly can. All of this is just part of the modern mindset. And I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's kind of useless, you know. It's, it's kind of, if you had this power, if you had this power, and it was everywhere, and it was everything, and it created, as Holmes says, the, the mind that made a star being the same mind that you use. If this power existed in this form, would we not want to use it? Would we not want to give everything up for it? And the people who do and who have throughout history, we've called them mystics. That's why Emma wrote a book about high mysticism, the people who've said, look, I myself can do nothing. It's the power within that does the work. So what this has to do with Halloween is this. You know, we've, we've I, I was trying to think up a catchy slogan for you, and I, and I think, Maybe I got it. Less horror, more honor. Less horror, more honor. When I read through the stuff about Halloween that comes across my news feeds and all that, it's gory. It's nasty. You know, it's, it's psychotic, a lot of it. It's just, I don't know, it's, it's revolting. Um, when I read about Sawin, it's inspiring. It's uplifting. When I read about the Day of the Dead, it's exciting. It's uplifting. It's also funny. Because in my understanding of the Day of the Dead, you, you reverence those who've passed, but you tell funny stories about them. And I was thinking about that, thinking about how on this stage, at this very spot, a number of us stood on the 3rd of October and told some funny stories about a couple of people we dearly love and greatly miss. And not too many weeks before that, we stood here on this very spot and told stories about a, a gentleman, poet, who we dearly love and sorely miss. And we told funny stories because funny things happened with these people, and that was not at all disrespectful. Oh, no, it fleshed out the experience. Why did we like these people? Not because of the solemnity of death. We didn't, they didn't come into our lives and they said, one day you're going you're gonna to pass away from this earth, so I must like you, you know. Uh, because, you, because you remind me of, the, of the, the outcome that awaits us all. That's something out of Dickens. Or I don't know. No, it's, it's, you make me laugh. You make me happy. You're a nice person. You're a nice person. So we look at the passage of people out of our lives. We tell the funny stories about them. And you can have a sense of humor about your spirituality altogether. 
because life is ironic, life is funny. We are, as you know, spiritual beings having a human experience. I'm sorry, that's funny. It's paradoxical, it really is. It's just, right? When you get into the experience of it, it just, it cracks you up. So, if there were a power, and you know there is, and I know there is, that we could access at any time, why would we not? And if there were a power, because there is a power that we can access at any time, and it has a number of unique ways of manifesting itself, would we not also want to access those? I got into some of those last week with you about symbols. When life hands you a symbol, you get to interpret it. It does not have a meaning intrinsic to it. It has the meaning that you give it. So why not look at all life as symbolic of good, as symbolic of growth, as symbolic of joy? Well, if there were powers around you that were subsets of this one power like there are with people, okay, would you not want to interact with them? Think about it this way. When you were in the crib, you know, as you grew, more and more people came into your life. Initially, you had your parents, your siblings, grandparents, whoever were around the crib. Then you, you went to nursery school, or then you went to kindergarten, and then you went here, you know, and all of a sudden there are more people. You never got to a point in your life where you said, I've met enough people, okay? I've met 10 or 20 or 200 people, therefore I, I get it with people. No, there are always more people coming along. Now, you do tend to sort of sort them into the categories of the previous people that you've met, and you believe that people have styles and all that, but that's beside the point. Your good is coming to you very often through a person you haven't met yet, through a situation you haven't been in. Your good is coming to you in surprising ways. It's around the next corner. The next good, I mean. The good that, you've, that you inhabit now came to you through people came to you through experiences that you didn't know you had. So where I'm going with this is this. Somebody asked me one time, in the context of that book Daniel mentioned, somebody asked me, do I believe, what do I think about angels? Does the science of mind believe in angels? Do I personally believe in angels? And I sat there and I thought about it and I said, well, I've never, I thought to myself, I've never seen an angel. Some say they have, I believe them, I haven't. But I thought, and this is what I wrote, why would you not want to believe in angels? Angels are cool. Everything I read about them, oh, every now and then they're ferocious, but they're cool ferocious. They're like righteous ferocious. But usually what they are is helpful. They show up and they, they pick you up when you fall and they dust you off and they put you back on your way. Why would you not want to believe in something like that? Why would we not want to believe that there are powers and energies and entities surrounding us that are benevolent. They're not jumping out at doorways at us to scare us. They're not here to confound us, mess with us, derail our plans. They're entirely benevolent, these forces. They're also not slavish, by which I mean they're not like assigned to us as personal butlers, you know? They have their own life, they have their own energy. But where our paths cross, there is mutual good that can come of that relationship. Why not believe in these things? And where I'll ask you to start believing in them or consider it today is in the context of ancestors. I'm not leaving out elves, dwarves, goblins, you know, the, the, the uh, population of a lot of the books we've read, and so on. But that might be a stretch for some. Ancestors aren't. You've met many of them. Your parents, their parents, these were your ancestors. If they're with you still, they're still your ancestors. They don't have to leave the planet to become ancestors. As soon as you show up in their life, they become ancestors. Later, they become non-physical ancestors. And they had parents, and they had parents, and on back into the mists of time. Some of you have studied this, I know, because you tell me. As a matter of fact, I've gotten some real interesting stuff from one of our practitioners, John Rennie. Hello, who's watching today. 
who's brought me ancestral material about Emma Curtis Hopkins and the Holmes family and some of the founders of New Thought that he's dug up, okay? But you have, may have done some research into who your ancestors were. Maybe you had, but they're there. And their energy is still with you. And it does not subtract that energy from them where they are now in the great beyond to claim that it's with you. And they, like other non-physical entities, are not your butler. They're not your maid. You know, they're not here to, to make choices. They're not here to make choices for you. They're not here to clean up after you. You know, they're not here to push you around. None of that. They're just benevolent energies. Benevolent energies. And at this time, what Day of the Dead and Halloween and Samhain all have in common, though they come from different cultural vantage points and so on, is the belief that the veil is thin. The veil is thin. Now, is the veil actually thin? How do you prove a thing like that? What I've found useful is to believe that it is, and not just today and not just tonight. But the veil is always thin. This is a time where we turn and face the thin veil, you see, and we acknowledge the thin veil. And again, we say on the other side of that thin veil are not dragons and monsters and awful things that want to eat us. On the other side of that veil is our history. On the other side of that veil is everything that came before us that enabled us to be who we are now, including all the great spiritual teachers. And so let's broaden out the definition of ancestry. It doesn't have to be blood. You know, a lot of people come to teachings like this and they say, I feel like I found my, you can almost say it in unison with me, I found my family of choice. I found my family of choice. Meaning, no disrespect to my biological family, they were great. But as you move along in life and your, your needs change and your heart moves in a different direction, you surround yourself with people that you've actually opted in and you know that you have. Maybe you opted into your family too. You know, it's hard to say. Your biological family, their theories on that, but you know you picked your friends. You know you picked your traveling companions in this life and the people that you partner with, the people that you create a household with, you know. These are your ancestors too. And then I got to thinking to broaden this out even further. Let's say you had, which you did, a great, great, great grandmother. You had four, six, eight, sixteen of them, twelve of them, I don't know, something like that. I have to do the math. I'm not good at math. But you had a bunch of them great 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 grandmother now imagine when she was 17 your great 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 grandmother faced a life crisis she didn't know you'd have to place it in history what was going on back then but she didn't know who she was she forgot that there's a power she was depressed she was distressed she was in she was suffering in some way Maybe they were poor. Maybe she was sick. Maybe she was taking care of people who were sick. Who knows? We're just making up this story. But it's, in its way, a true story. Imagine that your great-great-great-grandmother met a friend who told her, in the language of the time, I see more in you than you see in you. And you have what it takes because you are what it takes. You are a remarkable individual who's going to do great things in this life. And what I want you to know is there's a power and a presence that surrounds you and it's got your back. Okay? It's going to take care of you. And all you have to do is show up in life. And I'm using real modern lingo for how this would have been expressed generations back. Right? But you get the picture. And imagine that your great, great, great grandmother bought it. Felt it. This conversation with this person, whoever it was, changed her life. And so it changed her family's. She brought into her family this spirit. If she had kids, she brought into her motherhood this spirit, and on and on. And all the people who met her and circulated with her thought, this is a woman who knows who she is. Just imagine that. And so who she was at the moment the story began, changed, because she changed. And so it came down the generations to you. So not only was she your ancestor, so was the friend. 
so was the person who told the friend the things the friend knew to tell her. So was the book. So was the teacher who came into their lives, who influenced them in this way. And suddenly your population of ancestors just explodes. We look at the New Thought family of writers, Emma this month and the others that you know of, modern and 19th century and then some further back than that, you know. And we say, oh, this was such an impactful person. They had to, well, where do you suppose they got this stuff? They got it from, a lot of it from within their own soul, but the languaging of it, the structure of it, they typically got from somebody else. A lot of this channels back to Emerson. Okay, but Emerson did not, uh, did not operate in a vacuum. Emerson read everything he could possibly lay his hands on. And so all of those people were Emerson's spiritual ancestors, and if you read Emerson and he speaks to you, then they're yours. And on the other side of this thin veil stand all of these beings. All of them gifting you, gifting you today, every day. But let's start with today because it's where we're at. All of them gifting you with the miracle of your own being, the recognition of the miracle of your own being. That beautiful song we just heard was behold, you know, and it's all of this, and then it's so awaken. Behold, awaken. It's not enough to just behold. You behold, you move on. It's like visiting an art gallery, this beautiful piece of art. You behold it, wow, what a beautiful piece of art. When you awaken to it, it's like, what was the artist feeling? What am I feeling? How do these things connect? Suddenly, you're part of the process. You're part of the art. You're the performance art that the visual art is having in the room. You see? You see how it all connects? When you hear the music, you become the music. You're the next verse of the music. So just, I invite you, amidst all of the candy corn and all of the hoopla and whatever you got going on tonight or whatever you had going on last night when a lot of the partying of this occurred, you know, or that, or you're one of these bah humbug, I'm too old for this kind of nonsense. You know, when I was a kid, when I was, you know, I can't have candy anymore, it's not good for me. Well, it wasn't good for you then, but now you know it, I guess, <laughs> you know. And you've decided to draw a line in the sand, no more candy, no more candy. Well, let it be about something more than that. Let it be about the idea that the veil is thin between and there is nothing to fear on the other side of it. There is nothing to fear on the other side of it. Look. Your people are proud of you. The people who were proud of them are proud of you. They're proud of the use that you're making of spiritual principles in your life right now and today. They're proud of where you're heading. They're excited to see the next choice you make and where it's all going to go from there. Okay? So let's join in knowing, in gratitude for these who have come before us, who stand behind us, who surround us with their love. These beings of light that we are connected to by blood or by sympathy down the ages and all these powers and presences and all that the imagination can stir up that might exist. The angels of this world, the elemental beings, in this together and we we've, we've overlooked them for too long so now we invite ourselves to know that the one life that is spirit includes all forms of life including the non-physical the invisible and that there is a positive and healthy intention running through all of life like a thin live wire that electrifies, illuminates, and animates everything we are about. This thin live wire is accessed through regular spiritual practice of prayer, meditation, and I'll add a third, astonishment. To be astonished out of our 
intellectual embrace of things out of our descriptions and explanations and limitations to be startled awake from the nightmare of separation from our source into the dawning of the new day of the realization of oneness for this knowing and the way that it manifests in form in and through each one of us. I am so deeply grateful. I release this word now into that one life that I think of the goddess and God. And I let it be so. And so it is. Thank you, Mary. That was absolutely beautiful. I appreciate that. Personally, I appreciate that. I don't know about all you guys, but I do. <laughs> so, um, and thank you, Jesse. That was absolutely beautiful. I personally appreciate that as well. Um, one thing I wanted to mention with Mary, um, I don't know if you guys noticed or if everybody even saw, she is so talented. She's turning the pages, doesn't miss a beat. I mean, it's just absolutely phenomenal. So I just was amazed by that. So I just had to mention that. Um, but now we come to giving time. As our ushers make their way to the back, I would like to ask, is there anyone here for the first time today? I didn't think so. Welcome back, everyone. I just wanted to say that and make sure. Um, and for anyone that's online for the first time today, please uh, let us know. You can comment in the chat. You can also send us a message on Facebook Messenger. We will reply and answer you. And now, as we come to giving time, I invite everyone to say with me, divine love through me, blesses and multiplies all the good I am and have, all the good I give and receive. I am prosperous now, and so it is. There's a lot of laughter here. I wonder why. <laughs> hey, Kimberly, that, that was fantastic. Not just your voice, but the way you presented it. Your expressions on your face, that was truly fantastic. I, st I stood behind that iPad transfixed. Thank you. Well, you may be wondering who this is in this garb. Well, the truth is that Reverend Lisa was actually abducted to work at the Renfest. But before she got abducted, she actually managed to reach out to Discworld 
and contact the unseen university and they said that they would send a wizard down. And they found one that just looks like Reverend David, how he would if he was dressed up. Therefore, here I am. <laughs> While I still remember, we have practitioners on duty today. In the room, the children's room at the back will be Marissa Majo, who's nodding her head acknowledging that. Online, we will have Sharon Minure, who will be actually attended by telephone. So if you need treatment online in the room here, it's available. Just moving back to sort of the theme that Reverend Jesse was talking about and sort of not the theme, you probably know the origin of the word Halloween. It means All Hallows Eve, or if you want to translate it into modern English, that's All Saints Eve. In other words, it's the day that we celebrate saints. We know that we're all in touch with God. We're all expressions of God. Therefore, we are all saints of God. This day is to celebrate not just the saints who've gone before and not just our ancestors, it's to celebrate us too. So let's just know together that as expressions of God, because there is only one source, there's only one life. And we are expressing that one life now. Let's just know for each and every one of us that as we go through not just this day, but all our days, that we really, really and truly connect. And I'm knowing for each person in this room, each person online, that this day is special to them. They may not know it now, but the day is special because it's a celebration of them. So I claim for each and every one here, each and every one online, I claim good. I claim peace. I claim love. I claim health. I claim security. I claim wonder. I claim wisdom. And most of all, I claim gratitude because gratitude is probably one of the greatest of these. So in this knowingness and in this gratitude, I release this word into that law of which we're all a part, and I say it's done, and so it is. So it is. Say with me now, something wonderful is happening through me. Something wonderful is happening through me. I feel it in my body. I feel it in my body. I feel it in my mind. I feel it in my mind. I feel it in everything I am. I feel it in everything I am. I choose it. I choose it. I trust it. I trust it. I use it. I use it. And I love it. And so it is.